Thank you. I welcome members to the 21st meeting in 2014 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and ask members to switch off any mobile phones. We have apologies from Mike McKenzie. Uh, agenda item one is the Legal Writings, Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill, a title we'd better get used to. Our uh, first agenda item today is oral evidence on that bill. This is the first Law Commission bill to be considered by the committee following changes to the standing orders in June 2013. These changes altered the committee's remit in order to allow it to take the lead role in scrutinising certain Scottish Law Commission bills. Members will recall that this new process was put in place to improve the implementation rate of Scottish Law Commission reports, and we'll be hearing from the Scottish Law Commission shortly. This morning, we will begin the process by scrutinising the bill, and we will take evidence, firstly, from Scottish Government officials, then from the Scottish Law Commission. So I welcome from the Scottish Government, Jill, Jill Clark, who's the team leader of the Civil Law Reform Unit, and Alison Cool, who's the Deputy Director of the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Uh, and I'd invite Jill Clark to make a, an opening statement. Good thank morning. you. Um, we'd like to thank the committee for inviting us to give evidence today. Um, we're particularly pleased that this will be the first bill to be considered under the new Scottish Law Commission bill procedure. Um, the Scottish Law Commission published the report in April last year, and in September of that year, um, the conclusion of contracts bill, as it was called then, was announced by the First Minister as part of the programme for government. Um, in February of this year, in a letter to Lord Pentland, which was laid in the Scottish Parliament, the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism set out the view of the Scottish Government that this bill would be suitable for the new Scottish Law Commission bill procedure. That letter also set out that the Scottish Government was wholly supportive of the policy aims of the bill and the Scottish Government is therefore entirely content with the approach taken by the Scottish Law Commission. Ministers have carried out some further focused and specific consultation and some changes, mainly of a minor and technical nature, have also been made to the bill as it was published in April last year. Uh, none of those changes alter in any way the policy aim as set out in the Scottish Law Commission's report published in 2013. And they have been made in close collaboration with and with the agreement of the Scottish Law Commission team. In summary, the Scottish Government is of the view that the bill will modernise Scots law, ensuring it remains fit for purpose and as a consequence, it should result in the increased use of Scots law and with be will benefit business and the economy. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. And it's very good to hear all that. And I suspect there are a few bills before this Parliament that were quite so consulted on and consensually put together. Uh, nonetheless, we'd like to explore some issues, starting with the background to the law. And that will be led by John Scott. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning, uh, ladies. Um, and can I just seek a little bit of further background uh, to the law and ask for an overview of how the current process of contract signing works in commercial situations and an explanation of the need for commercial contracts to be probative? And secondly, an explanation of what delivery means in practice and how the current rules on delivery of hard copy documents apply to specific agreements given that certain documents, for example, mutual agreements, need not be delivered in order to be effective? Um, if I take the first part of, of the questions, which is how it works just now, I, mean, I think the, uh, the report, the SLC's report, um, describes that very well, that at the moment if you choose to um, you know, transact under Scots law, you'll either have to have one of these round robins where you send your... Um, documents to each party that's involved or you'll bring everybody together for a signing but more often than not as the evidence um, shows and the evidence that was submitted by the SLC um, last week and um, people are just choosing not to use Scots law because of the, those difficulties those practical difficulties um, on the other parts of the question I don't know if Alison wants to pick up anything um, yes um uh, well, the bill also deals with um, delivery, which you've mentioned, and this is delivery in a legal sense. Um, and one of the issues that the Law Commission, I'm sure they will talk about that in a great deal more detail than, than I'm able to talk about in terms of their consultation. Um, but one of the uncertainties of, of Scots law at the moment is it's not clear whether you may deliver a traditional document by electronic means, and that is an issue, can be an issue with the conclusion of missives. So one of the things that the bill does is to 
set out that a traditional document may be delivered by electronic means. OK, thanks very much. OK, I'm, I'm wondering whether you could expand on any of the other particular problems that you're seeking to resolve. I, I suspect that it, it would be helpful to me if I was clear that we had a kind of list of issues we're trying to deal with and this is how we're dealing with them. Uh, I think I've got the, the general issue. Um, but to say, what other, what other issues other than the difficulty of getting people together and the issue of whether or not an electronic signature is, or an electronic communication is valid? What, are, what other issues are you actually trying to resolve, please? I think um, there's the issue about whether execution in counterpart is valid in Scots law, and, and that's very... Um, unclear at the moment. So by placing that and the um, delivery of a traditional document by electronic means on a statutory footing, that puts the matter um, beyond doubt. Uh, it's also helpful with things like um, the timing of documents and, and when they kind of conclude. Um, that's much clearer. So it, it's adding clarity and consistency to the law, which is lacking, which has the, the effect of people being reluctant to use Scots law for these sorts of transactions. Why would anybody then choose to use Scots law at all? Um, some um, organisations have to, um, because that they must. Um, for example, I think the uh, Sc Scottish government's procurement project um, contracts have to be um, carried out under Scots law, and there are some other um, types of transactions which you must use Scots law for. So you don't have the choice of opting for another um, law. So you must you must use Scots law in these um, circumstances. Right. Okay. Um, we've seen, I think, quite a number of examples of people choosing to use other law. Uh, I, I confess, I'm I'm still a bit confused as to why this isn't something that people recognise before they start. Uh, I'm just trying to get the background to this. As I, say, I think detail other people might want to explore. But if you're in the commercial world and you know that the law is the way it is, why would you even start on the basis that you might be going to use Scots law and then finish up using English? Generally, people don't. I think they, they opt for, for English law quite early on in the process because, because of these difficulties. So we have got a real problem to solve. Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Right, thank you. OK, um, I'm wondering whether Stuart might like to take over at this point. Uh, right, convener. I want to just explore a little bit about the subject of electronic signatures, and I'm going to approach this via a little bit of research I've been doing. Um, the first thing I looked at was the electronic communications... Electronic Document Scotland Regulations 2014, which is 2014 of Week 83, which essentially says you need an advanced electronic signature. And then it makes reference to um, the 2002 regulations. So I looked at the 2002 regulations. And the 2002 regulations, which are UK regulations, the Electronic Signatures Regulations 2002, uh, that's number 318, uh, talks about uh, the need, when it's an advanced electronic signature, for there to be a certification service provider. Uh, and it goes on to establish uh, a register of such uh, service providers. I then sought to find the register. Um, and that proved to be formidably difficult, I have to say. I eventually found a paper from the Department of Business, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform, uh, paper URN 09 of week 642, uh, which actually doesn't say anything about uh, the register, and it's only when I printed it out I realised on the very back page the register was there present, even though nowhere in the paper does it say that's the case. And there is a single name on it, and that's the point to which I'm, I'm, I'm navigating. Um, and that leads me to the fundamental question. Um, that is a single name, but my experience uh, tells me that m most people who use um, certification do so through commercial suppliers other than the single name, that, which is uh, British Telecom, um, that, that, that's on that uh, register. 
uh, mainly people like Verison and, and so on and so forth. And I just wonder what the effect on the legal certainty on, of, of an advanced electronic signature is when, in fact, people are using certification that relies not on the person that is on the UK register, but on commercial providers who are located in other jurisdictions. Um, and I just wonder what the effect was. Um, I'll, I'll be try and cover this. I mean, I think it would be fair to say that the, the concept of electronic signatures is a developing one. Uh, and you mentioned the 2014 regulations, which uh, have, have just been put through the Scottish Parliament and talk about advanced electronic signatures. And I think there's an important distinction between what those regulations are dealing with, which is land registration transactions, essentially, and the process set up in the Land Registration Act 2012 and the amendments to the 1995 Act, which deal with what uh, I would refer to as full electronic documents and the documents for which writing is required under the 1995 Act uh, and a very particular process uh, and requirements set out in the 95 Act. Uh, now, as you say, there, there are certain difficulties in um, the, the suppliers of advanced electronic signatures, and, and that is a, at an early stage. Um, this bill is generally not dealing with those sorts of transactions and the sorts of transactions for which full electronic signatures, um, as set out in the 2014 regulations, are required. Um, it, that is possible under this bill, but in general this bill is deal dealing with the transactions which start by way of a traditional paper document, which may then be transmitted by electronic means. And in those circumstances, there are a variety of ways in which an electronic signature may be applied, which is not a full electronic signature certified um, in the way that you have described. It may just be uh, somebody's name typed into the document and provided the parties have agreed that is acceptable, then that is a perfectly legitimate way of um, agreeing that transaction. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sure the Law Commission will, will talk about this in more detail, but hopefully that, that clarifies the two electronic signature scenarios. Uh, right, I understand the distinction between electronic signature and an advanced electronic signature. An advanced electronic signature essentially is a longitudinal view of the whole document that makes sure not a single electronic bit in the document is changed after the application of the signature and therefore reflects the content of it. Um, but I'm now left somewhat puzzled as to what the legal value of what we are doing is. What is the legal certainty that is offered if the signature is independent of the content of the document, an electronic signature, because the whole value in general terms of electronic signatures is that they reflect the content of a document. Or is this just simply a much simpler provision that, that, that's making, <coughs> giving legal certainty to something where there is already practical certainty? Yes, I mean, what this bill is allowing is for people to sign um, separate documents. Now, that can be done um, on wet ink with, with um, pen, or it can be done by an electronic signature, which doesn't have to be a full advanced electronic signature. Uh, but in a sense, could that not be done by agreement in any event? And, and, and on that basis, why do we need the legislation? Well, uh, I think the Law Commission obviously carried out a very full um, consultation and the, the uncertainty as to whether it is possible for parties to um, a legal document to sign separate duplicate um, duplicates of the document, uh, that it is not thought to be possible. Um, so parties are reluctant to do that. That's the, the gap that this bill is, is um, filling. So if I might, as an observer, forgive mm. me, then what we're being asked to do is to provide that legal certainty by statute Indeed. to a process which might not be changed at all, mm. but the legal validity of which is at least doubtful. Yeah, and, and the legal validity will be established from, from the date the bill comes into force. We're not applying these changes 
retrospectively, I think we've said it would still be possible uh, for people um, who've signed um, existing documents to argue that execution in counterpart was a valid um, way of doing this, but the experience of the Law Commission was that, that nobody actually signed documents in this way because of the uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I suppose I could go on at some length, but perhaps the, the, the fundamental final question is, um, given that the electronic character of the document, and indeed the signature for that matter, is not protected in a technical sense, I'm not talking about a legal sense, um, is not protected, uh, is it likely that people will wish to use this process if there is not the use of advanced electronic signatures which provide that technical protection for the content of the document and the inscription of the signature? Well, I think people sign documents now with electronic signatures which are not full electronic signatures, so the bill is not changing the law in, in that respect in, in any way, and it will always be open to, to show that an electronic signature was not applied in an appropriate way. But, sorry, do forgive me, Camina, mm -hmm. but my concern is, is the signature which is now being put into the legal process when the validity is being tested the same signature that was applied? How, how would one know? Well, in the absence of the protection that comes yeah. from advanced electronic signature. Yes, but, but I mean that, that's the existing position when people sign documents. I mean, the fact that we are allowing documents to be signed um, by counterpart doesn't, doesn't exacerbate that position in any way. I think that's the helpful thing yeah. to hear you mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Thank you, Camilla. Right, so let's, let's move on. Margaret, please. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about electronic document repository. The SLC report indicated that there was merit in an electronic document repository being set up by the Registers of Scotland. The bill doesn't deal with this matter, although the policy memorandum notes that SLC's recommendations will be dealt with it in due course. Can you give me what your thoughts are on the need for an electronic document repository and what you think the likely time frame and steps would be for setting up such a repository, please? Um, the, the bill doesn't cover it because there isn't a legislative requirement for it. It doesn't need legislation to establish it. And um, our priority has been on the um, recommendations in the report which did require the legislation as, as provided in this bill. So we've not really turned to that particular chapter of the report yet. Um, but um, you know, in line with the, the Scottish Law Commission's recommendation, you know, we're keen that we do get involved, that we're certainly happy to do that and to look at the matter further. Um, and I expect that will happen after this legislation has, has gone through. Um, but I couldn't give you a firm time scale. And our understanding is that um, registers of Scotland, who obviously have a big part in, in the electronic um, document repository, are still very interested in, in, in the whole issue. And if, if you're going to hear from them, I'm sure they'll provide um, more information. So we are kind of willing participant when, when ready to do so. But there hasn't been um, any input from the Scottish Government to this point in time. Thank you, Kavita. My question is on uh, the issue of pre-signed signature pages. Uh, because in England, uh, there have been suggestions uh, that the application of a pre-signed signature page to a different contractual document could increase the risk of fraud, as such signature pages could be attached to a different document to the one originally signed uh, and this uh, well one specific case has led to a rule in the English Law Society's practice note that for them to be binding there needs to be clear evidence that signatories have agreed to pre-signed signature, signature pages. Now I'm aware the, um, the bill appears to follow uh, that approach however um, I'd be interested in exploring your views what the, um, in what the general issues are regarding uh, the use of pre-signed signature pages and specifically and why you feel that the provisions that you have made within the bill on this issue are adequate to um, address any risks of fraud in relation to the use of counterparts? 
Okay, I'll probably start to deal with that. Um, yes, I mean, you mentioned the, the English um, case law in which the Law Commission mentioned, and, and they looked at this issue and, and talk about it in their discussion paper. Uh, I think the, the basic position in Scots law is sort of reasonably clear that uh, a signature page um, can't simply be used on a document without more. So if I have uh, put my signature onto a piece of paper, somebody cannot just apply that to uh, a document and say that, that that has legal effect and I have agreed to that document. It's necessary for there to be some sort of authority in relation to the use of my signature page. Um, and the bill simply um, reflects that. Um, so the expectation would be that the document that you are uh, you have applied your signature page to is the document that the other party um, applies their signature to in counterpart. Um, the, the Law Commission talk about the scenario where a document changes during the signing process. For example, it's discovered that there are some um, typing mistakes or some other um, aspects that parties want to change. That might happen if one person has signed the document and the other person still has to sign it and parties don't want to start the process again. Um, in those circumstances, provided that the person who's already signed the document um, authorises those changes, then um, that, will be, uh, that will have legal effect. But the key thing is that that person has authorised the changes. Otherwise, um, the document would be legally invalid. Um, and that, I think, is an entirely different situation from, I think, the one that the English case law dealt with, where a signature page was signed independently of any version of the document, and that's what caused the issue. Now, again, it, it may be possible to agree that um, the, the document is legally valid, but it would be necessary um, for the person whose signature had been applied to that document to um, agree that after the event. Um, so. I think the bill, uh, there was some suggestion during the consultation. Uh, one of the law firms uh, were, were looking for a, a more a looser arrangement. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what they were, some greater authority for the use of prepaid signature pages. It, it wasn't entirely clear, but I know the Law Commission um, felt that uh, there should be no change to the existing position, that that was a perfectly um, a valid position, and the Scottish Government certainly agreed with that approach. So you're confident um, that uh, the measures you've brought in do not make it any more, uh, there's no increase in likelihood of yes, use of fraud yes, on these indeed. issues, and, uh, and that the current yeah. law actually is, is robust on these issues in yes. any event time. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I think I'll turn to Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, just in, in terms of uh, of this particular bill, um, as we are aware, certainly it is inspired by English law. And uh, certainly as a, as a consequence, and kind of following on from, uh, from Richard's uh, questions a moment ago, um, are there any other practical issues or difficulties uh, which uh, have been encountered uh, in relation uh, to the English law of counterparts? Um, not, not that we're aware of. Um, and certainly the, the approach that we are taking, we think, is more robust because it does put it on a statutory footing. And some of the difficulties they've experienced in England and Wales is because it isn't on a statutory footing. So, I mean, the practice note that exists now, that could, that could become um, obsolete if um, you know, judicial law changes that at some point. So um, our approach is different and, and should overcome those sorts of difficulties because it, it, it's more absolute and clear. Um, how widely used um, is the... Is, are these procedures uh, in England and Wales at the moment? Um, I, I couldn't tell you um, in terms of um, numbers. I, I would expect that they're, they're used, they're well used. Um, I can certainly try and find out if that would be helpful. Uh, it, would be, it, I certainly don't imagine that you'll be able to find out uh, the numbers of every single transaction. Like, no, but, but certainly if there's a, a, a ballpark figure, that would be very useful. Uh, just uh, uh, on, on a, a different uh, uh, kind of note, in terms of the, the policy memorandum, um, it's got the, in paragraph 27, it uh, talks about the, the Digital Scotland agenda. And in terms of the, this bill uh, in front of us, uh, what, uh, what is the, the estimated uh, environmental impact uh, that will actually t uh, take place in Scotland? Uh, and also, uh, what is the uh, the, the economic impact 
uh, that, uh, that, you th that, that you foresee will actually happen in Scotland as well? Um, the, the business regulatory impact assessment includes um, some figures um, about potential savings, but they're fairly small, and they, they would depend on you know, the extent that um, a firm uses, I suppose, or undertakes lots of multi-party uh, multi-jurisdictional um, transactions of this nature. I mean, the savings for an individual firm could be quite um, significant or they could be quite um, small, depending on their use. And certainly the impact on, on the environment is on the basis that there'll be much less travel, you know, people not having to fly to a signing meeting, um, and um, less paper, potentially, as well. So there, it's around the margins. It's not huge but it's, it's positive on, on both fronts. And in terms of, uh, once the, the bill goes through the parliamentary process and uh, if it is uh, successful in the parliament, uh, what measures will be undertaken to actually promote this new facility uh, and these new measures that Scotland will actually have, uh, obviously on a statutory footing, uh, to encourage uh, businesses, to encourage trade to actually use Scots law? Um, the Minister has already written to um, a range of representative bodies to highlight um, the, the bill, what it will do, and its benefits beyond the kind of commercial practitioner usage, but just for anybody who, who can't get together but they've got some kind of legal document that they want to conclude um, the benefits there. So that's started and that will continue. But to be fair, I think that the, the practitioners are just waiting for this um, to, to happen and um, would be pushing a, a fairly open door, I think it would be fair to say. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, pick up on the digital agenda for Europe. I'm not quite sure where that stands, and in that context, and just more generally, is there work coming from the European Commission, from the European Parliament, that's likely to affect this area in the future, because it's certainly there's a there's a policy agreement in Europe uh, that creating a pan-European digital infrastructure with standards around this sort of thing would be of value, and I just wondered uh, where we stand with that. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I, mean, I think um, as the Law Commission have said, we, we are in a sort of position where we sort of have a mixed economy, as it were, at the moment of traditional and electronic documents, and, and we haven't yet moved to the full, um, full electronic system across the board. But but no doubt that um, is for the future. But one of the things we're, we're keen to ensure is that the bill is, is future proofed in that sense, and, and we'll no doubt talk further about the, the sort of powers that we we've included in the bill at a later date. Thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And incidentally, you've, you've answered the question that I was just about to pose to you about, about the future. Um, so I think unless there are any other questions just at the moment, I, I thank you, ladies, for your contribution. Um, and we'll turn to the Scottish Law Commission next after uh, a wee break just to allow the witnesses to change. So I'll suspend the meeting just for a moment, please. Have. Thank you.
Right, let's uh, resume, and it's my huge pleasure to be able to welcome the Scottish Law Commission and Lord Pentland, the Chairman, Hector McQueen, Commissioner, Malcolm McMillan, the Chief Executive, and uh, Stephen Bailey, who's a Legal Assistant, Charles Garland, who's from the Government Legal Service for Scotland. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, this is actually quite exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I think for those of us who do this thing, it's, it, you know, that's... Let's just you know, recognise that's where we've got to. It's been a long process, longer for yourselves, actually, than, than for us to get to a point where we, we can now implement this kind of legislation. So, uh, welcome. Um, I don't know whether, Bill Pendleton, you'd like to, to make any opening remarks and well, then John will lead us through the questions. Yes, per perhaps I could just say a few words by, by way of uh, thanks and, uh, and further introduction, uh, convener. Firstly, uh, we, are, we at the Commission are really uh, extremely grateful for the opportunity to give evidence to yourselves on this, um, on this bill at stage one of its parliamentary consideration. Um, I think you know the different roles which my colleagues have played in the uh, evolution of this project. Um, Professor McQueen is the Law Commissioner with responsibility for uh, the uh, project which we are conducting on the review of contract law across the board, and this bill emerges as part of that project. Uh, Charles Garland is the project manager who's been working on the uh, contract project, and he's obviously been closely involved in uh, the development of this uh, proposed legislation. Stephen Bailey, a legal assistant, has also been working on that. And I myself have been at the margins of it in my relatively short time at the Commission. But before you begin, begin your questions, um, members of the committee, could I just make a couple of very brief observations? And first and foremost, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to put on the record that uh, the Scottish Law Commission is very appreciative of uh, all the work which has been done by the Scottish Parliament, by members of this committee, uh, by officials and by the Scottish Government in putting in place these new streamlined procedures for parliamentary consideration of certain law reform measures. This is, we are convinced, an extremely valuable innovation, and it will greatly assist the process of systematic law reform uh, in this country. The second observation I would briefly offer um, members of the committee is this. Although the Scottish Law Commission is, of course, an independent body which stands apart from the government, we fully recognise that we must work in close collaboration with others to ensure that our recommendations for improvement of the law are acted upon and do not merely gather dust on the shelves. So please do not think of us as ensconced in some sort of remote ivory tower uh, in Causeway Side. All our recommendations are built upon detailed consultation and engagement with stakeholders. And this particular bill is, I believe, uh, a good example of that. We know from those in the field of practice that their clients were very frequently not prepared to make their contracts uh, subject to Scots law because of the uncertainty about whether the modern system of execution uh, in counterpart extensively used as members of the committee know, elsewhere uh, in the world, particularly south of the border, uh, was valid and effective as a means of concluding contracts here in Scotland. And often, as we understand it from the uh, research and discussions we've had, that was the only reason why they did not choose Scots law. Despite the fact that there would be many so-called connecting factors pointing towards Scots law as the natural choice of legal system to govern the party's contract. The presence of the parties and their advisers in Scotland, the subject matter of the contract affecting Scotland, etc. And that is an anomaly which we want to see uh, removed. And we believe that once it is removed, if it is removed, uh, there will be considerable scope for Scots law to be used much more extensively uh, in commercial and other contracts concluded in and affecting this country. 
and that will bring about obvious economic benefits. And finally, may, may I say, uh, convener, members of the committee, that we um, at the Law Commission uh, really look forward to developing a strong working relationship with uh, yourselves and to giving evidence before you on many more law reform bills in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. I, I think probably the rule of the road is that we'll do with number one first and we'll worry about what comes down the rail afterwards. Uh, and I'd invite John Scott to open our questions. Uh, thank you very much and thank you uh, for your opening uh, remarks, uh, Lord Pentland. And, and while you may have to an extent covered uh, the question I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you, as is I think um, common legal practice, the opportunity perhaps to answer it again. Um, and in, wherein I'm seeking an overview of how the current process of contract signing works in commercial situations and an explanation of the need for commercial contracts to be probative and, and further an explanation of what delivery means in practice and how the current rules on delivery of hard copy documents apply to specific agreements given that certain documents, for example mutual agreements, need not be delivered in order to be effective. Yes, well, um, perhaps, uh, Hector, you would, you would um, address uh, those points. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think the answer you were given to the, to the same question um, by the Scottish Government colleagues is indeed the case. The round table uh, signing ceremony, the round robin, uh, these, are, these are, are commonplace. I think it's also fair to say um, that uh, commercial contracts don't require to be in writing at all. And what one is seeing increasing evidence of in the courts is the use of email, quite informal emails, being enough uh, to constitute a contract, Some, usually because if, if it's a case, because uh, that takes the party involved by surprise. Because there'll be someone saying, how can these informal emails saying, OK, let's go for it, co possibly constitute a contract? But the answer is they can. And that leads really into your, 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 your second point, I think, which you asked about uh, the probativity of documents. Why do commercial people want um, to, to, to do it in writing when it simply adds perhaps a layer of complexity when need to otherwise exist? And I think the simple answer is that especially when very large sums of money are involved and quite long periods of time, then people want a document that they can refer to as their sort of guideline, if you like, through the money, through the, 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 the years of performance that may, may, may well be involved in, in this. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's the creation of certainty is why people want to use documents. And increasingly, the, the, the traditional methods are either cumbersome and difficult to, to achieve, or alternatively, they're too slow when time is, is absolutely critical. And I think that's, that's exemplified in some of the instances we give in our uh, written evidence. Of, and it could just simply be between Edinburgh and Glasgow. It doesn't have to be international. It could even be between different parts of Edinburgh. There is not enough time. Things have to be done by certain uh, deadlines. Uh, I think I'd finished my answer to this. But, uh, I was thinking when, when you asked the question before of the story I was told by an Aberdeen solicitor when I was um, uh, giving a lecture on this subject uh, up there uh, before Christmas. And he told me that one of the reasons he liked his fisherman client to uh, um, uh, get it in writing when he was doing expensive things like buying fishing boats and so on was to get him to take it seriously. That to bring him into the office, to get him to sign the document in front of a witness who also signed, made this delightful individual realise that he was actually doing something significant. So the form can sometimes be of value to ensuring that the client knows that they're actually signing up for quite a lot of money and time uh, in, in the future. Could, could, I, could I just add um, something based on my own experience, uh, practice of commercial law, which is that uh, we're, one is often dealing with, um, with clients, uh, particularly those um, from outside Scotland, who to begin with are instinctively a little bit wary and suspicious and unconvinced by the fact that we've got a separate legal system up here. They don't really know much about it and they think it's a bit odd. If they are told 
that uh, there is some even slight doubt about the rules which affect the legal validity of their contract. They are simply going to take the cautious approach. And there's an easy alternative available, which is, well, let's just write it subject to English law. That may be the kind of instinctive reaction anyway. And uh, it, it is actually a major, a major consideration. And of course, one is dealing here with uh, not just parties who are inherently cautious and conservative, but also their advisors have that mindset. Good. So this this is essentially a, a catching up process. I think so. Yes. Um, and putting us into uh, the twenty first uh, century. Yes, and it's certainly possible that a court presided over by a judge like Paul uh, would find, if it if if he had to, that the execution counterpart is already valid. It is possible, but there are lots of people who take the view that it isn't. And we give some examples of, of well-known law firms uh, who have expressed that view publicly on websites and so on for the information of their clients. Uh, so that there is a sort of um, uh, a real issue there, and we could wait forever for the case that decided one way or the other. We can solve this problem by putting through this, this piece of legislation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious that you gave us quite a number of examples and then you've heard of others. Um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there are issues that you're aware of which this bill is actually not going to solve. Um, uh, it may sound unreasonably negative yes. at the very beginning, no, no, but um, I, mean, I, I quite see why we're doing this. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, yeah. I think that's well explained. Yeah. But yeah. are there bits yeah. out there that this isn't yeah. currently dealing with that we should be aware of? I think possibly the major issue may be the question of delivery of documents. Um, uh, one could have an argument as to whether we should have a rule of delivery of documents as the necessary step to making them binding and effective. Couldn't we do it by communication or some other system? But I, I don't think we're quite there yet, and I don't think we're in a position to say with confidence what the overall law on delivery, if it's to be there at all, should be. I mean, and what we certainly perceive uh, is uh, a principled notion of what is delivery. The party who grants the document puts that document beyond its control so that it can no longer be changed. Um, but how exactly does that principle uh, operate in all the complex contexts that we have uh, today? So certainly one of the things I would like to look at is the law and delivery in general. It's a horrible mess if you go and look at the books on it. What we're doing is straightening out one bit, the electronic bit, um, and I think that's probably the most important in practice. That's clearly the most significant issue uh, in practice, but there are other questions um, out there, and it may be that this is one of the things that uh, this contract project might go on to consider over the next uh, few years in the in, in, in the in the law commission program. So that message that says, "Okay, go for it." If I've sent it by text, but the text never arrives, we yes. still don't know what the law says. Not with any degree of certainty at the moment. We have addressed some of these questions actually in other bits of the, the discussion paper, which preceded the execution and counterpart. But we brought forward the execution counterpart to report and draft bill stage because it was clearly impressed on us that that was the most urgent issue. But yes, there are a lot of questions about uh, what is delivery, what is communication, and so on. Um, and uh, they are not resolved. But on the other hand, it is also reasonably clear that at the moment they're not causing the kind of major difficulty or people to withdraw their uh, support, if you will, from Scots law. I think there are similar questions actually in English law and in many other uh, legal systems uh, around the world. Indeed. Right. Could I just add, on a more general level, perhaps, uh, convener, in answer to the point you ask about um, other parts of the law which might benefit from, uh, from improvement in this area. It, it's an issue that we, we wrestle with at the Commission, whether it is better to uh, go for relatively small, manageable, 
short-term projects or and this may be the more traditional approach, but it has given rise to difficulty in the past, whether a law reform body should be focusing its attention on large chunks of Scots private law. Uh, and that, I think, is an issue which has um, been one that law reform agencies throughout the world have had to deal with. My own thinking, just for what it's worth at present, is that uh, we should perhaps be focusing our attention on the smaller, more manageable, more readily realisable sort of projects. And this, as the committee will know, is something that crops up. Sorry, I'm widening this a bit, but it's maybe an opportunity since it's the first time we're here. Crops up in the context of formulation of our next law reform programme, the ninth programme, which is what we're doing just now. I think that's a debate to which we'll return, but yes. mercifully it will be another day, and yeah. if we could stick with this particular subject. Yes. Uh, and, and I'm talking to myself because I drifted off it, uh, to be followed by Stuart Stevenson, I think, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And I know the members of the panel will have had the interchange I had with the, 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 the bill team itself. Uh, so I suppose I'll just cut to the chase on, on, on the subject of electronic signatures. Given that the electronic signature, which we're now giving a legal certainty to, is not of necessity electronically connected to the document which it signs, how does that actually leave us in a more secure legal position? You know, should we not, in fact, be moving to a position where we create a legal certain system that is more ambitious without clearly at this stage mandating its, its use? Well, I must say that one of the things I uh, thought early on in the project was that the answer to all this was indeed the electronic. And I put that proposition to um, uh, the, the law firms uh, with whom we were engaging. Uh, and the universal answer, interestingly, was, quote, there was no client demand for it. Now, I'm not absolutely 100% convinced that there is no client demand. Um, I think what was also reasonably clear was that uh, the solicitors, the practitioners, were themselves reluctant to engage with electronic signatures too far, too quickly. Uh, I think part of the concern is indeed with the security, even of the advanced electronic signature and of the uh, certification process, which was mentioned in your previous um, discussion, being brought about largely actually by commercial providers who are exposed to the hazards of the, the marketplace. And we give in, in the discussion paper one or two examples of uh, certif certification service providers who've gone bust in the Netherlands and so on and so forth, causing a lot of, of problems. Um, the interesting development which is in process and which we mentioned briefly in our uh, written evidence is that the Law Society of Scotland is now issuing all of its members with a smart card which will provide an electronic signature for every uh, solicitor uh, registered with the Law Society of, of Scotland. Um, and clearly that opens up certain possibilities. Um, so far as we were able to establish with um, the Law Society and, and registers of Scotland, who are also significantly involved in this because of these new land registration rules that were referred to, um, uh, the, um, I think I've lost my thread for a moment, if I can just try to regain it. Um, yes, the, the point is essentially that that these electronic signatures could be used by solicitors on behalf of their clients, provided they had the appropriate mandate to do so. But another of the points that was put to us in discussion of this, as, as at that time an abstract possibility, now a slightly greater possibility, um, was that you require a mandate every time you apply uh, the advanced electronic signature that you were referring to. And of course, it may well be that you apply your advanced electronic signature to what you believe is the final version of that document in its electronic form. And then the next person to come along to apply their advanced electronic says, ha ha, page 13, my name is spelt wrongly, or the, the wrong company number is given, um, or, or as I found myself recently in a convincing transaction in which I'm involved, my national insurance number was not given correctly. 
and so on. These are the sorts of things that happen and hold up these transactions. And it's important information. It's important that it is correct. So you then have to go back to the beginning, but you have to get a fresh mandate for, as a solicitor to apply that advanced electronic signature to the now new document uh, again. And it was said that this would be much too cumbersome. Actually, doing it in the written form, which is actually provided for in the Requirements of Writing Act, is uh, 1995, is actually slightly uh, easier. It's not exactly easy, but it's, it's a lot easier. It's basically the famous putting your initials in the margin at the place where the document has been manually corrected. So the, the obvious advantages, they are obvious advantages of the electronic, are there, but they have drawbacks from, again, a purely practical and, and pragmatic point of view. Um, so my sense overall, as, as we went through this um, uh, consultation process, was that we are still in a transitional phase, which may go on for many years yet to come. The mixed economy that was mentioned um, uh, previously, paper is still important and paper still has certain advantages. A final thought is this. Uh, the, the transactions in which uh, we see this operating primarily, to begin with at least, are ones where the parties will often have been negotiating with each other for years before they get to this particular stage. So they are in a pretty close and basically trusting relationship. They know each other and they know that they are expecting a signature page to come from Stuart Stevenson Limited to Hector McQueen Limited uh, at, at the other end of the line. And we have our lines of communication uh, well established in our solicitor. So there is a close relationship of trust. And that's why I'm not unduly concerned in that particular context about some of the issues that uh, have been mentioned about signature pages and so on. Um, we will have to rely on the law as it is for other transactions between parties who are less familiar with each other perhaps in the future, as may well be the, uh, the, 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 the case. But I think that would be an issue in the present law, and it's not an issue which one can clearly see a solution to without creating all sorts of burdens uh, on business and people carrying out perfectly reasonable transactions when they know each other perfectly well. Um, so I think, I think we have to be very cautious in this area, but to keep our eye on uh, developments. And that, I guess, is where it may be useful that there are these uh, ancillary uh, powers in uh, Section 5 of the, of the bill. I, just if I may pick up on the subject of re-mandating, I, I, I just wondered, and of course I'm a lay person, so I've been exposed to some specific things at some specific points without comprehensive understanding. Um, the, 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 certainly my, my, my understanding, for example, in the purchase of property, where the process, your agents at each end are going to be talking to each other and finally eliminate all the concerns and get to an agreed position. But every time that happens, it always seems to go back to the client yes. and re-mandate yes. where you are. So it's not an unfamiliar process, whether electronic or paper, it no, seems no, to me. That's certainly and, true. And, and, yeah. and yeah. just one second, mm. if I may. And similarly, having just re-signed my, my will in the last few weeks, having updated it after quite a long time, um, I found myself signing every page. And I would expect, if there was an error, to be called back to re-sign a page. So you're trying to characterise there being a difference between the practical application of signatures in the electronic world and the paper world that I'm not sure I recognise. Would you like to comment on my observations? Um, well, I, I, take, I take the point. Um, the, um, how should I put it? The, the point that it was put to me by the solicitors, I suggested that perhaps they could take a more general mandate in the, in the client's affairs. Um, the argument against that, from a client's point of view, is that that means you're placing a very significant degree of trust in your lawyer. And, of course, that is something that lawyers would like to think all clients should do, but for some reason they, they, they don't invariably uh, do so. And it really would be quite incautious to give a general mandate with regard to an electronic signature and its application to, to documents. It has to be something that is specific uh, and, and, and precise. Um, so I think the point, perhaps, that I would rest on is that the differences 
between um, electronic and paper in this regard are not significant, but they are practical difficulties. And in the commercial transaction in particular, where time is critical, and I think that is one of the, 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 the key questions, to be going to and fro back between client and solicitor is not a very desirable situation if you have hours or minutes left to meet particular uh, deadlines. And that's the argument really in favour of the, the paper, that you can actually be quicker with paper uh, than you can with um, uh, the electronic. I, I, I have to say I remember being a spectator because I'd been the project manager for the electronic system. Um, of watching a CHAPS transaction. It was our first one over £1 billion, mm -hmm. which was, of course, to deliver the exchange of ownership of an oil rig. Mm -hmm. And because it was done in CHAPS, it was done in less than 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I have to say you... Well set up in advance, I well, think. Well, correct. Yes, yes, of yeah, course, yeah, of yeah, course yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but isn't that precisely the point you're making? Mm -hmm. Anyway, let yeah. me just, rather than indulging myself in reminiscence. Um, are the Scots Law Commission looking at taking this further, in particular creating a, a legal certainty around uh, a more robust use of electronic signatures, in particular the advanced electronic signature, for which there is a legal framework already? Certainly one of the issues that we've identified as a general theme that could inform the ninth programme, the chairman may want to say... Yes. A bit more in that. I, I think um, while I, we readily understand why this um, measure has given rise to the interesting discussion about um, electronic conclusion of contracts and use of electronic signatures, etc., which is an issue out there at the cutting edge of legal practice, I suppose, it's perhaps worth just uh, reiterating that the focus of this measure is rather more limited. It's on authorising conclusion of contracts in counterpart form and permitting electronic delivery. But as you will have seen perhaps from our discussion paper, inevitably we got into questions about electronic signatures, etc. But yes, on a general level, we are extremely interested in, um, uh, in, in ensuring that our law stays uh, closely in pace with technological development. It is very easy for a legal system inadvertently to fall behind the uh, rapid rate of technological development. And uh, we're thinking about this quite closely, as Hector said, in connection with the Ninth Programme. Don't want to get into that. But we also see uh, that it uh, ties in well with the government's Digital Scotland strategy. Just finally, then, um, I've, I've got in front of me uh, an article that appeared in PLC magazine in April 2012, Practical Law uh, magazine, which is written by uh, a couple of authors from Slaughter and May. And they, they give three tests for whether electronic signatures work. And I just want to ask you if you think that what's being proposed here meets the three tests. It says, to achieve a level of certainty comparable to a handwritten signature, an electronic signature needs to be, one, unique to the signatory, two, created using means within the signatory's sole control, and three, capable of being linked to the relevant document or data in such a manner that any subsequent changes to that document or data would be detectable. And I suspect the problem, as I currently see it, lies with that third requirement. Yes. I think I, think I would accept all, 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 all three. I think the further issue that I would uh, ventilate here is one that was hinted at earlier. I don't think it would be easy to look at this in a purely Scottish context. It clearly has to be done on an international basis. I don't think it's enough to do it on a UK basis. I don't think it's enough even to do it on a European Union basis, although, although the powers that be in those respective bodies may not think so. Because the basic point is we have an international, a global economy, and what we do has to tie in with uh, what, what is happening elsewhere. I'm bound to say what I know of the Law Society's uh, smart card suggests to me that that is very much the way the Law Society has been thinking, and it has looked for a card which would have 
uh, a global recognition so far as is possible within the present rather fragmented state of things legally. Okay, thank you. Uh, Margaret, please. Um, building on that, your actual report, when I'm talking about the electronic document repository, um, although the bill doesn't deal with it, your recommendation says that you would deal with this in due course. Can you explain what you mean by deal with it in due course? But all yes, I, I don't think it was, it was us who said we would deal with it in due course. I think we took it as far as we could in the context of the, the exercise, and in a sense it's over to others, not just the government, I, I, I should hastily add, or indeed just registers of Scotland. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have no doubt, uh, whatever, from what we saw during our um, consultation process, that law firms could run electronic document repositories. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that stops them doing so. In fact, they probably do have electronic document uh, repositories of the kind that we envisage in the, in, in, in the report. The problem, as we saw it, was that um, uh, if I'm your solicitor and Charles is uh, Mr. Stevenson's solicitor and so on, and there are multiple parties, why should any of us trust the other person's solicitor to hold this precious document that we are all trying to uh, create uh, and negotiate together. And that was why we thought that registers in particular could provide a service which would be attractive. And consultation suggested that that was indeed uh, the, the, the case. It's the trusted uh, third party, if you will, uh, that's known across the legal profession in Scotland and um, uh, has the technology uh, capacity um, already, given its electronic registers and, and so on. And it is very much going forward in, in, the, in the electronic uh, direction. I think the latest intelligence we've had from uh, registers says that they are certainly remain interested in this. Um, but they are concentrating for the moment on getting the implementation of the 2012 Land Registration Act uh, going. I think there's a, is it the 30th of November or something this year is their uh, scheduled start date for the new All Singing Dancing Electronic Land Register. Uh, and once that's up and running and the teething problems which will inevitably arise and so on have been uh, resolved, then they will start looking at it. Because it, it is a, a significant interesting business proposition for them um, and the only questions really are um, the ones that we in fact discuss in our report which we think are the major issues that uh, solicitors at any rate would look for from such an electronic document repository there may well be more and I'm sure there'll be wider consultation but the thing we are certain of is there is no need to change the law to enable that to happen the registers already have the power uh, to do this under the Land Registration Act. There is absolutely nothing now after the uh, same Act and its amendments to the 95 Act to stop people using electronic documents and applying electronic signatures of the appropriate standard. The one issue that we think uh, might be relevant, and we've expressed this in response to registers' consultation, is the level of uh, advanced electronic signature that they are requiring at uh, certain levels may be too high, that it's higher than is needed to have the legal effect it wants. And our understanding is that registers will review that in two years' time, uh, Charles, was it? I can't quite remember. But at any rate, once, perhaps it might be two years from the 30th of November uh, or whenever the things come into effect. But that is the, uh, the one bit of law that we think at this present time it would benefit from another look in due course. Excellent, thank you very much for that. Richard. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I raised with the, the first panel issues around pre-signed signature uh, pages because in England uh, there have been suggestions that the application of a, a pre-signed signature page to a different contractual document could increase the risk of fraud uh, if such signature pages are attached to a different document to one originally signed, there was a case in England which led to a change in 
uh, the English Law Society practice note. Now, I understand, Professor McQueen, what you said earlier, you're not too concerned about some of the issues regarding uh, pre-signed signature pages, but you know, I'd like, it'd be good if you could expand on that and say what other um, or wider issues you've had to uh, consider uh, in, in regard to pre-signed signature pages and just also more, more fundamentally why you think the bill is robust in terms of um, challenging any risk of fraud in relation to use of counterparts. Well, I mean, I think the present law is reasonably robust mm -hmm. in the sense that um, uh, if, if, if a signature <laughs> is challenged in general terms, then it is for the person who says, that is my signature or that is your signature, to prove it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you like, the onus is to prove that the signature is genuine. That's, what, that's the sort of starting proposition. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are actually very, very few cases where that yeah. is, has, has arisen, for whatever reason, I, I really don't know. So I think the Scottish courts would undoubtedly reach the same result as the English court did in mm -hmm. yeah, its case. Valid, yeah. um, and I think what that clearly means is that uh, no more than you would advise a client to sign a blank check or a set of blank checks and leave them uh, with, with your closest friend or your worst enemy or whoever, no more should you be uh, signing signature pages ahead of knowing what the, the document is. That would simply not be an effective uh, signature, although it might expose you to quite a lot of trouble uh, if, if you were to do it. Where we think the issues uh, arise uh, are really the, the document that is changed in, in progress when perhaps it's already been signed uh, by some of those involved, or even all of those involved, and then a, a mistake of the kind I was mentioning earlier uh, is discovered. And this is not uncommon. Uh, and whereas in the good old days, um, uh, the thing was carefully typed out and bashed out and checked and compared and so on by very skilled uh, typists or uh, whatever in, 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 in typing pools, um, today it's all done by word processor, and the, the word processor is a wonderful uh, machine, but it does lead to degrees of slippage, which didn't perhaps exist in the world as it was when it was purely um, printed. So it's quite common to discover that you have made a mistake in a document, but a very easy solution to that when you've got the signed document is to go into the computer and correct the error on the relevant page, print that page and as, as the saying goes, slip it into the document. And so far as the naked eye is concerned, there's nothing wrong with that uh, document. But our view is that if that was established uh, as a matter of fact, then the signature would have been applied to a different document and the signature is no longer uh, valid uh, at that point. So I think one has to think about the pre-signed signature pages in different contexts. The, the one that is really pre <laughs> document. And the one that isn't really pre-document is, however, the document itself has changed or been changed in some way during the progress of the, 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 the signing ceremony. Um, now, we're quite clear that the present law says there is no uh, valid signature, there is no valid document, therefore, in, in, in that context, unless there's either been authorization uh, by the uh, signatory in advance. So you, if, if, if I had pre-signed a signature page because I was going on holiday in France uh, next week, knowing that I would have to be informed as to what the document was that was now being signed, how that's to be done is, is a matter for uh, the, 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 the party and the agent uh, in, involved. The more typical situation, however, would be the ratification that is to say, something that happened after the document had been signed, i.e. my slipped page example, which I think is actually the much commoner situation in the transactions with which uh, I, I'm, f I'm familiar as a result of this exercise. Uh, and there you need a ratification. And obviously the ratification there would be, you know that now page 93 has Hector McQueen spelled M-A-C as opposed to Hector McQueen spelled M-C. And that's obviously a much less troublesome thing uh, in general than um, uh, the other, uh, where I've left my blank signature uh, 
document with no idea of what the document is, how do you get the authorization in advance for that, is, I think, a very complicated and difficult practical matter. But in terms of the, the, the case which, which pertained in England, where um, the courts found that the documents, therefore, weren't legitimate, yeah. it, that, that's already established in Scots law, yes, as far as you are. So does, it doesn't Scottish, need case law. Yeah, to yeah. I think that. a Scottish court would have gone down the exact same route. They'd have yeah. had the same reaction yeah. as... Mr. Justice Kitchen. I don't think the Scottish courts would have any difficulty with that reasoning at all and would regard that decision as persuasive, although not, strictly speaking, binding. It is important, just to add to what Hector said, that to appreciate, perhaps, that um, ratification is something that is usually inferred from conduct, from evidence about conduct subsequent to the, um, the alteration to the contract. Thank you very much indeed. John? Yeah, it, forgive me, it's probably a naive question, but while this is going to be much more convenient in the electronic world we live in, given what you've just said, is it more open to uh, manipulation documents after signing? <laughs> I think documents have always been open to manipulation on signing. Again, we were told many tales, which were always, of course, not personal experience. It was simply stories that people had been told by others about others again who had done things with documents. Uh, I, I fear that um, probably documents are changed every day. Um, and because it's in nobody's interest to raise the, the question, it doesn't get raised. Um, so that, it's a difficult one. I mean, the, the, the example I gave um, uh, from my own experience within the last couple of weeks of changing the national insurance number, it was my wife's national insurance number that was on the form that was to be returned to HMRC, uh, so that the stamp duty, <laughs> uh, land tax or whatever it is um, uh, that was appropriate to the purchase I'm making was paid. Um, we changed it, and I initialed the change, uh, and uh, we thought that probably that was enough. And at this point in time, HMRC have not come along and said, hey, what about this? Um, so is that uh, a, a wrong thing to do? I think in the vast majority of cases, it's absolutely harmless. You know, it simply proceeds, uh, the, it, it facilitates the transaction. But there will be cases where it matters, and the uh, case, that the English case, which is the one and only case of its kind of which I'm aware, um, it did matter quite a lot. It was quite a large sum of money that was at stake in that case, and it was the tax authorities who were on the case. But, but forgive me, but just coming from a farming background, I mean, there, there will have been documents that will have been deliberately falsified where the insertion of a comma or or change, changing a, a comma into a semicolon yeah. could uh, make a difference, and yet, uh, 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 and, and that will have existed yeah. presumably in Scots law hitherto. Yes. Well, there are for, uh, yes. yeah. uh, this will this process essentially make it safer or not? I don't think it'll make it safer, but I don't think it'll make it any worse than it already is. And it has to be said that. Um, uh, Paul and his colleagues in the uh, Court of Session are pretty astute at detecting <laughs> dodgy documents. Um, and there are cases that are there all the time, uh, really, where a judge will say that I have the strongest suspicions that these documents have been manipulated or that documents have been destroyed. Um, that happens a good deal as well. Um, so the judges are astute and alert to the possibility, particularly in the kind of recessionary period that we've recently experienced. There have been a lot of cases in the courts of people trying to get out of deals that they did or having tough deals enforced against them and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I could certainly find you cases where the judges identified, presumably with the help of counsel, um, persuade them on the other side. Working on the balance of probabilities, which is a much less demanding standard, be it remembered, than beyond reasonable doubt, yes, this document is not what it purports to be. And there are plenty of rules in place to allow the, 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 the validity or invalidity of these documents to be tested and uh, the right decision reached in the courts. 
which is ultimately where it really matters. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Stu? Uh, good, uh, uh, Nigel. Um, good morning, panel. Um, just following on from some of the comments earlier uh, this morning, in terms of uh, this bill, well, the bill actually uh, take the Scots law onto, uh, onto a, a level playing field, or uh, will it actually give us uh, a competitive edge in the, in the global market? My sense is it will give us certainly a level playing field, um, and it might give us a competitive edge by virtue of its statutory formulation. Um, I mean, the, the law in England is by no means free from doubt. It's essentially emerged through um, practice. Um, and while the English courts are very good at recognising good practice, every now and again they discover actually that practice wasn't that good. And the case that was mentioned is, is, is a, a, an excellent example of that. And it was that case that triggered the practice note in England. But if you read that practice note, you'll see it tells you uh, things like, you know, make a photocopy at this point or whatever. Um, and that's all very helpful. Um, but the world moves on, and you want actually general rules that t leave it to you, actually, much more flexibly um, to, to, to decide what you need, and in a sense uh, are, are future-proofed. So we think there is a possibility that um, uh, there's a competitive advantage, or perhaps an, an edge is, is the right thing, and that people may be attracted to say, well, the Scottish procedure under this bill is clear, clean cut, it's, it's based on clear legal principles. Why don't we execute our documents under this system? In a sense, it'll be for our lawyers, I think, to rise to the challenge that presents. Um, and they're certainly hungry enough <laughs> uh, to, 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 to want to make it happen. What I think would really clinch a competitive edge um, but this is a, not a matter of law reform, and it's the stuff that's left out of the bill, is that electronic document repository. Um, I think that would be seriously attractive for business purposes around the world, because you, it doesn't matter where the repository is, and you could be making your uh, contracts under any law you like um, there, but using the, the, the electronic facilities and all the benefits that that, that brings. So I think there is the potential for uh, genuine competitive advantage in that particular uh, context. Charles, did we identify something similar in Spain? Um, we certainly identified that there is uh, an equivalent of uh, the smart card, which the Law Society is currently proposing to, to issue, which allows uh, exchange of information um, securely, Mm -hmm. between people who hold these, these signatures. So it was, it was something akin to that, and I think it had uh, had, had, had very great benefits um, in maybe unexpected areas, which is not particularly in view in this bill, but in the, the field of criminal law. I think it had enabled um, instruction of, of counsel uh, in, a, in a very secure way, which hadn't been available before. So I think so, yeah. I wouldn't want to get this out of proportion, but in, ans in answer to your question, uh, uh, I think yes, it will certainly put Scots law onto a par with um, accepted good international practice, but also it could be used as a selling point by imaginative and creative uh, legal advisors, because uh, as far as we are aware, this will be the first statutory formulation of the rules governing the practice of execution and counterpart anywhere in the world. And we need these selling points because in the real world we are up against a much larger, more dominant legal system south of the border, obviously. That uh, leads me on to uh, uh, my next question, which uh, you may or may not want to, to answer. Uh, and after I ask the question, you'll know why. Um, in terms of the, the global economy and uh, competitors, um, are there any particular um, countries whereby, um, also apart from, uh, apart from south of the border, but are there any, any other countries um, globally where uh, there is a, uh, potentially a great deal of uh, competition that, uh, that we could possibly uh, gain uh, some additional business from if uh, this bill goes ahead? Yes. Well, one, one of Paul's predecessors was on a plane crossing the Atlantic uh, when uh, he found himself sitting next to a Texan businessman. 
and uh, uh, Lord Drummond Young, it was, told um, this chap about our proposed electronic document repository, and this Texan businessman was extremely enthusiastic about the idea. He really liked it. So it's possible <laughs> that Texas might be a good place to, to uh, make a start. Um, in all seriousness, I think the, the critical thing for um, uh, Scott's lawyers would be to look at the places that are, so to speak, already doing business in Scotland or that Scottish uh, businesses are doing business with uh, outside. And that's a very widespread thing. Um, one must make no mistake about it. But it's, it's, it, the, the, the Scottish business and Scotland are playing their part in the, the global economy. They could do more. Um, but it's a way of drawing. That, that's where I would start, by looking for business. That may mean uh, the European Union. It could also mean the United States, I think, and Canada, since they are both pretty accessible. Uh, our research has showed that um, execution and counterpart is widespread in uh, Australia and New Zealand. And you, that shouldn't really be a surprise, given the scale of these countries and the fact, nonetheless, there is a lot of business going on there. Um, so um, uh, I think these are countries that are very familiar with this process. And these are places, particularly, I think, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, that Scots do a lot of business with. I think it's also worth uh, reminding members of the committee that um, as you will know, in international legal practice is largely driven by the very large English law firms um, based um, originally in the city of London. And they are global now in every sense of the word. We need to ensure, I'm sorry to keep harping on about this, but we do need to ensure that when it comes to these basic rules of practice that we're not falling behind the, the game. Right. I've got a further question, uh, convener. Just uh, so in terms of the the, the mandate, um, and uh, I know that Stuart Stevenson was asking some questions about this uh, earlier. Um, obviously, we're talking about electronic signature for uh, for contracts, uh, and there, but the issue of the mandate. What forum um, should that come in? Should that be electronic as well, or should that be wet ink? I, th I think the. <laughs> I think what uh, the solicitor will tell you is they want the mandate in a form which they can produce later on to justify uh, what they did. So it would be unwise to depend on an oral mandate. I'm not sure that they would be particularly concerned beyond it being in a form which was capable of use later as evidence, should it be necessary. Thank you. OK, I think that probably concludes questions. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming along and being so forthright about what I hope, which is clearly what is clearly the, the first step in, in the process of, of this bill. And what I think I detect, we all hope will be the first step in a process of reforming Scots law, because there is clearly a certain amount to be done. So I'll again briefly suspend this meeting while our witnesses leave. And thank you very much for coming.
indeed. I thank colleagues for all that's just gone before, and I turn to agenda item number two, which is instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Legal Profession and Legal Aid Scotland Act 2007, membership of the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, Amendment Order 2014 draft, nor on the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, Notification of Duties and Powers Regulations 2014 draft. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Thank you. Agenda item three is instruments subject to negative procedure, the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Amendment Order 2014, SSI 2014-142. Drafting of the order appears to be defective in two respects. Firstly, paragraph five of class 9b in part 2a of schedule one to the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Order 1992 as inserted to the schedule in this instrument into ALIA purports to define the terms enclosed shopping centre and retail park for the purposes of class 9b. However, those terms are not used in the class but are used within the definition of a shop or financial professional services establishment in paragraph 5 to class A. Secondly, raised platform is defined for the purposes of class A referred to above to specify the minimum height of a platform but it should also have been defined for the purposes of use in the term in class 9c, paragraph 2f. Thus, the committee therefore agrees to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the reporting ground I, as the drafting appears to be defective. Thank you. Does the committee agree to note, however, that the Scottish Government has undertaken to make an amending instrument shortly to correct these errors? The National Health Service Superannuation Scheme Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2014 SSI, SSI 2014-154. Several points have been raised by our legal advisor in relation to this instrument. Firstly, there has been an unjustifiable delay in the laying of the regulations before the Parliament as they were made on the 16th of May and laid on the 30th of May. While the delay does not affect the validity of the instrument, it also amounts to a failure to comply with the laying requirements of Section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 that the instrument must be laid as soon as practicable after it is made. The period of delay in laying the regulations is unusual and is not satisfactory. Does the Committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground D as there has been an unjustifiable delay in the laying of the regulations? Does the Committee also agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground J as a laying requirement in section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 has not been complied with? Thank you. The Committee may wish to indicate its disappointment that the aforementioned delay follows a similar delay in the laying of the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-43. Does the Committee agree to do so? Thank you. The committee may wish to note, however, that the Scottish Pension, sorry, Public Pensions Agency is again contacting the Treasury with a view to steps being taken to seek to ensure that the omission is not repeated. Further points have been raised by our legal advisers in relation to this instrument <coughs> as it contains minor drafting errors. <coughs> Firstly, Regulation 11C and the consequential references to the provision which that paragraph inserts have been included in error. The Scottish Government has confirmed that these provisions have no substantive effect and an amendment will be brought forward to make the appropriate provision as and when the Finance Act 2014 is enacted and the relevant regulations under it are made. Secondly, Regulation 24, so far as it adds new Regulation 2J1412 of the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme 2008 Section Scotland Regulations 2013, refers to host board when this should refer to contracting health board. The Scottish Government has undertaken to amend the provision in due course. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the, the Parliament on the general reporting ground as it contains minor drafting errors? Can you do that? Sir. Um, just in the light of your uh, en passant reference to the Treasury, you, you, you are of course uh, making it clear that the Treasury did provide the appropriate signature on the 16th, but did not uh, advise that that had been done until the 30th, so that the delays to which we've previously referred were entirely down to failure of processes in the Treasury, albeit that in terms of accountability to the Scottish Parliament, that lies, of course, with the Government and not with the Treasury. 
Does the committee also agree to note, however, that the Scottish Government has undertaken to correct these errors in due course? I agree. Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Land Register Rules, etc., Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-150, nor on the Adults with Incapacity, Supervision of Welfare Guardians, etc., by Local Authorities, Scotland Amendment No. 2, Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-157. Is the Committee content with these instruments? Thank you. Thank you. Agenda Item 4 is instruments not subject to any parliamentary Procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014, Commencement Number 1 and Transitional Provision Order 2014, SSI 2014-160, nor on the Act of a Journal, Criminal Procedure Rules Amendment, Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014-2014, SSI 2014-162, and nor on the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, Commencement Number 2, Transit Transitional and Transitory Provisions Order 2014, SSI 2014-165. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Agenda item five is the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. This item of business is consideration of the Scottish Government's response to the committee's stage one report on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. Members have seen the briefing paper and the response from the Scottish Government. Do members have any comments, please? No? Are we content to note the response and, if necessary, reconsider the bill after stage two? Thank you. Agenda item six is the Housing Scotland Bill. This item of business is consideration of the delegated powers provisions in this bill after stage two. Members will have noted the Scottish Government has provided a supplementary delegated powers memorandum and will have seen the briefing paper. Stage three consideration of the bill is due to take place on Wednesday the 25th. The deadline for lodging amendments is 4.30 this Thursday the 19th of June. The committee may therefore wish to agree its conclusions today. Newly inserted section 77A provides that elected and certain other politicians are disqualified from hearing housing cases transferred under the bill to the first tier tribunal. Newly inserted Section 77B amends the Rent Scotland Act 1984 to provide that the same elected and other politicians are also disqualified from being appointed as or remaining a member of the private rented housing panel. Both provisions confer power on the Scottish Ministers by order to modify the list of disqualified officers. Does the committee agree to recommend that the Scottish Government lodge amendments at stage three to make the new powers in section 77A3 and paragraph 1A2 of Schedule 4 to the Rent Scotland Act 1984 inserted by section 77B to the bill subject to the affirmative procedure? Sir. Um, I, I certainly agree with that recommendation, but I'd also make the more general point, which I have made elsewhere, uh, in relation to lists, that it would be good practice if and when the government is amending a list for it to republish the entire list in the amending order rather than to simply publish the amendments, thus avoiding the subsequent need uh, uh, for restating the lists after large amounts of amendments. And I think it would be useful to have that in the record. Does uh, sound a familiar plea, with which I suspect we would all want to agree. Does the committee agree to report that it is otherwise content with the instruments uh, newly inserted powers in section 77A and 77B? Okay. Suggested that the committee may wish to be content with all the other provisions in the bill that have been amended at stage two to insert or substantially alter provisions conferring powers to make subordinate legislation and other delegated powers. Are we content to report accordingly? Content. Thank you. I have to say that we understand there may be amendments at stage three, uh, and, but we will have the opportunity to consider those next week. Agenda item seven is the Buildings Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill. This item of business is consideration of the delegated powers provisions in this bill after stage two. Members will have noted that the member in charge, David Stewart MSP, has provided a supplementary delegated powers memorandum and will have seen the briefing paper. Stage three consideration is due to take place this Thursday, the 19th of June. The committee may therefore wish to agree its conclusions today. One might go a bit further and say they'll actually need to consider its conclusions today. Does the committee agree to report that it is content with the provisions in the bill which have been amended at stage two to insert or substantially alter the provisions conferring powers to make subordinate legislation and other delegated powers? Agree. We do. Thank you.
At this point, I move the meeting into private uh, so that we can consider item eight, please. Thank you very much, Doug.